Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Institute's Leading Edge. This is going to be episode nine. We're discussing uh, creating and selling value. Um, I didn't really think this was going to be as hot a topic, but when we posted in in the Facebook group, that thread has been going kind of crazy. Um, love to welcome our participants or our our guests here, our attendees, uh, Eric Tyler and Joel LeBron. Welcome, guys. We're excited to have you. Um, on this show, we've got a full panel. Um, We'll start by introducing Tom, one of our newest consultants. Tom's got a shop in Layton that's just uh, 30 minutes uh, south of us. Um, and he has grown, I think you started working with us three or four years ago and, and just kind of blew up and now you're in a position where you're helping other shops, which is awesome. Um, we've got Patrick Howard, who's in uh, Brea, uh, killing his new shop too. Um, and then we've got BJ Lee and my dad, who have both been working for a very, very long time. So the topic, uh, creating and selling value, um, we've been kind of bouncing this back and forth on a couple different, even, even a couple different podcasts as well as webcasts and some of our promotional material. Um, and I don't think people understand really what that means. So I'd love to start with, a, with just a general question. Um, and I'm going to kick it off to you, Dad. Um, what is value? Value is a, it doesn't, it's not real. It's, it's whatever the person believes in their head has value for them. Value is strictly um, a construct of the person that is, um, that is the person deciding what value is. Value for me is different than value for you. Value for BJ is different than value for me. Um, you know, so I think sometimes we think in a, in a real sense of, you know, they're going to spend 10 bucks. This is worth 10 bucks, but the same person might not spend $10 on whatever that is because to them it's not worth $10 and somebody else might spend 20 because to them it's worth $20 for whatever it's going to do for them. Right. Um, so value is not, not real value is in the heads of the people that you work for the, the people that walk into your shop. So, so you have this intangible thing. How do you make it tangible? How, what are ways that you can control that? Um, so, Tom, what are some ways that you've created value in your shop? Well, so, and I agree with Cecil, uh, value to me is my customer's perception of what I have to, to offer. And uh, perception is the key word there. Um, so, for me, I'm kind of a guy that likes to start uh, there's steps to everything. So for me, my first touch to a new customer is in my marketing material. Um, we got a ton of action on the, on our Facebook feed based off of this. But um, for me, I market some of the extra value added services I have like loaner cars, uh, a good communication. I've got a picture of my friendly staff on the, on the mailer. Um, so I'm communicating through my marketing pieces that I'm a, val a high value, high service shop right from the gate. And then from there, customers on the phone uh, or uh, even better customers in my parking lot. It starts in my parking lot. Uh, the perception that customers have of me starts very early before I even get face to face with them. So my parking lot has to be clean and organized. Uh, I've got to have nice signage. Everything's got to look good. They come in through my front door. Uh, everything's got to be nice, clean, organized, and uh, there's got to be a friendly, helpful face there waiting to meet them. And then from there, how you start building value is then you become the the guy or the girl in, in, in our office. Uh, people that are coming into a shop, I firmly believe, want to know that whatever they've got going on, uh, is just going to be okay. So you've, uh, you've very quickly got to establish you as the professional, uh, say you wouldn't want to go to the doctor and, uh, feel like the doctor was, uh, was winging it. Um, so it's very important that once you've got that customer captive in your audience, in your, in your office, you're showing them that, uh, you are definitely the person to take care of whatever issue they're having. Um, and there's, there's a lot of strategies that go into that, but, uh, that's how I do it. Uh, and then I'm very transparent, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm very transparent with the, the way I do business. I'm transparent with my staff. Therefore my staff is able to be transparent and show that value to my customers. So, 
So this sounds more like it's, it's customer oriented, but does, does that go both ways? Does it, does value also uh, go towards your uh, employees as well? Do they understand their value? Right. I feel like a lot of people out there don't really understand what their value is, let alone how to express it. Right. Um, I, um, let me, let me speak to that for just a minute. Cause this is another piece of the thread and it's been going on the whole time. Yeah. You know, in, in the thread, someone said, um, you know, shop owners out there aren't going to do X, Y, Z because they don't understand what they're worth. And I kind of have to agree with that. We, we, as an industry, having come from where we came from, many of us without, you know, college education as if that sets the bar, um, feel that we're not worth much. And therefore that holds us back in, in what we do and how we do and how we do things, what we charge, et cetera. There's another point here that I think becomes really, really important. And that is when you think about Walmart and you think about Nordstrom's, those are two different stores. Different people go into each of those stores looking for different things. And to those people, that's value. Um, there are going to be discount customers who want a cheap oil change. They don't want to do a lot of work on their car. They don't care if they beat the car to death and it, it, it strands them on the side of the road. They're pretty much sure that's going to happen at some point in time. And there are other people who want, you know, kind of an experience. They want to know that the car is never going to break down. They want to know that, you know, the car is going to last as long as they want it to. And those are different people that value different things. Um, when you talk about employees, I think we, I think many times because we don't value ourselves as business owners. And of course, we're talking generalities here. We're not talking about every shop owner. So please don't go online and go, well, I, yeah. think, well, I value me. Um, but a lot, I think our industry in, in general kind of has this sense of the customer won't pay, you know, X, you know, more than X dollars. Um, and I think that affects our employees because then they, the, everyone's kind of in the same place. They're kind of all, well, you, you can't do that. I don't know how many times I, I've heard you, you can't do something in your business. You can't raise your rate 20 bucks an hour. You can't charge a customer that, you know, BJ and I, we laugh back and forth. Um, you know, in, in Yucca Valley, you can't have a $650 average repair order. It's not possible because everybody's on, you know, welfare there or, or, you know, they're on some form of assistance or they're retired and they have no money and yet people do it. So value, you know, um, we, we need to think about what kind of a client we want. It goes into marketing and, 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 and then we need to determine what's important to them and then that's what we need to be talking about in our advertising. And that's what we need to be delivering uh, in our shops. And the better we do that, whether it's a, a cheap oil, if you, if you are the cheapest shop and, and then all of the cheap people are going to come to you. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. It's not a model I choose to run, but if you make money at it and you make enough money at it, then, then who cares? Um, I choose to run a different model because to me, uh, um, I want to be in a different place. Um, but I think you have to talk about marketing and, and maybe um, uh, uh, we could, we could maybe go into that in terms of creating value uh, uh, maybe for our clients or potential clients. So, so it sounds like a lot of the issue stems from the, so in certain shops, the issue stems from what the owner perceives as what is value. So you're talking about people who might be running a different model. Those models might reinforce perceptions of value like well I, i'll discount this this much and that shows that i'm i'm a good person and i'm worth that and that's what's valuable right so I, how I, do we change uh, i think i think you have to i think you have to think um uh, i i gotta add this because it's just super important it's almost more important what the person at the counter feels than the owner so if you have a service advisor that's talking to your customers that doesn't understand value doesn't understand why you have to charge what you have to charge, doesn't know how to deal with that and kind of thinks in what we call a discount manner or a we're not worth it kind of manner. They're not going to get yeah. the money at the counter. I, I only mentioned that because there was a comment. I think somebody, somebody <coughs> posted a comment where it was like <clears throat> the owner, the owner came in and, and said a two and a half hour job uh, took it down to an hour and a half uh, for the technician, which th that's why I mentioned that. I think, some of the owners, you know, have that influence. And if they're not letting the people at the counter do their job, then that's when it becomes a hindrance. BJ, you were, you were going to say something. 
Um, I, I, th I think I was going back to value and different things and people's perceptions and stuff, right? Um, on value, uh, the amount of money that can be received for something, right? And then the importance or worth of something for someone, right? Depending on who that client is is and has and then it gets down to how useful or important is it to that client right so oil changes may be important to some people but less important to others right um, so it depends on how useful and important it is to them right so then you get to uh, as Tom was saying also perceived value right you customer walks in the door when they see the building nice professional building they walk in they already have a perception Right. So if they're a value base and they want professionalism, they want somebody knows what they're doing. They're going to just from the physical appearance when they first see that's going to drive that type of person uh, to your shop. Right. Uh, I, uh, uh, Cecil and I and his father owned a shop years ago. And uh, I remember painting the building. The, the place is beautiful. Right. Um, and this older woman drove in probably in her 60s, 70s at the time. Uh, she was old to me. I'm pretty close to that now but um but she drove in and she jumps out of her car and i'm and i'm right there at the door and, and she stands at the bay door with her hands on her side and she looks around and she says this, this is where i want to have my car worked on i mean it was that perception when she drove in that it was a neat clean professional operation you know everybody was in uniform it was clean and so her perception that was a high value uh uh place for her to go and that's where she felt comfortable so if it was valuable to her or important and useful for, for her she will be our client okay you know, I, i'd add something to that um I, I was reading some article about apple okay the iphone that was a good one uh, apple has apple has the least amount of stores uh their phones are more expensive than everybody but what this article talked about was the experience that people receive when they go into the Apple store. That's, mm -hmm. that's, it's, 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 it's an exclu exclusivity. It's, it's, it's a perceived um, uh, emotional encounter uh, of exclusivity and, and higher end. And, and it's the difference between going Nordstrom's and going to Walmart. That's, that's, it's, it's all made up. It's all a matter of perception. The, the thing that we have to remember is that most people gravitate towards that more than the discount because there's an inherent, there's an inherent lessening of value when you pay less for something. Everybody knows that. It's, it's not new. This is not a new concept. Everybody in the world has experienced something that didn't cost much from Amazon or whatever, and it broke on them right? So people, people understand that when they, when they pay very little for something, they don't expect a lot in return for it. So when you, when you're spending a lot of money on fixing your car and charging what you should charge, there has to be an experience involved in that as well. And that's, and that's where the disconnect is in the industry. People, it's not just about raising your prices, uh, you, you do that, you're going to run people off. You've got to change the way you think about your business. But I think there's a certain amount of people out there that are just going to be a discount person. It's just about price. And we For may sure. not ever be able to convert that customer, right? And that's okay. Uh, yeah. I'm not worried about that, right? They're, yeah. they're not my guy, right? Not um, my guy. Right. I, exactly I can't, right. You know, I, I just have these rules, and one of the rules is, the business has to be profitable and it has to be profitable enough that everyone wins. And, and so if the, if that cheap guy comes in and he wants the cheap job, he's not my guy. In fact, I'm going to get myself in trouble if I let him come in and try to take care of him because I don't have what he wants. Yep. Right. I need to have what my customer wants and I need to feel good about giving them that. And I need to feel good about charging uh, for that. I'll tell you yep, some yep. people create value in a negative way because they don't charge enough. I was at a, a, a seminar in Mercedes shop and she said, Dick, we can't, br you know, our, our marketing isn't working and it wasn't bad marketing. It's not like, you know, I would look at it and go, I'm not going there, but their labor rate was um, like $79 an hour in a place where everyone else is 130. No, well, I'm not bringing my Mercedes into a shop that's $50 or less than, you know, the average other shop. Um, uh, the right Mercedes driver looks at the, the cost sometimes and says, 
wow, they must be good because they're, they're not cheap. And I can tell you, we have a client, we raised the, the rate. Uh, I think when we started with them, they were 119. I think they're either real close to 200 or just over it now, you know, three years later. And they're, they're lined up for six months. They, they, they're busier now than they were when they were less expensive. Um, so, so value can be created in a lot of ways. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, my shop's the same way. Uh, the shop that I just purchased, he was, he was running probably about a $80 effective labor rate because he was discounting everything and his posted labor rate was somewhere like 97. In eight months, and I don't recommend this for everybody, but in, within eight months, I've raised it from that all the way up to $140. And we just keep getting busier, 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 busier. Month over month, we grow. We get more and more cars. Um, but we've also added a lot of value stuff. We, we've remodeled the waiting room. We've got loaner cars. We've got a three-year, 36,000-mile warranty. We've got staff that's going to take care of you, uh, whatever you need. Um, do, you think, do you think that the belief in your staff – in because you you kept all the same people or most of the same people do you think that their belief changed about what they were worth do you think that's part of it absolutely i had a conversation with rob uh, um the other day and um he told me it it seems it seems like you've been here forever like like jeff was the, the guy before was never here before um it just seems like we've been here for such a long time and i go um uh, how different is it for you? He goes, I never really understood what it was to run a business until you showed me. Um, because the way he was doing it was just by the seat of his pants. It was, yes, there, there was definitely a shift in his perception of value, uh, when learning what we do and why we do it. Um, the, the number one goal is take care of the customer, right? We, we, we do a great job for the customer, create a great customer experience, uh, and, and charge a fair price so that we can make a fair profit so that everybody wins. Everybody wins. So, so how, how, how do we go about changing? Cause you're talking about something clicked, right? What exactly do these owners need to start doing or, or what should they be doing to, to get that to click and, and to register and start to make that change? Stop being afraid of their customers. Uh, and, and, and figure out who you want to be. Who do you want to be known as? Do you want to be known as the cheap guy, uh, the nice guy that just, uh, you know, patches your car up and gets you down the road? If that's, if that's the model you want to run, great. If you want to change and you, you want to make <clears throat> a living, uh, a good living for not only yourself, but for your staff, for your family, then you have to, you, there has to be a, a shift in perception of who we are. There has to be some self-worth in what we're doing. Uh, we have to be viewed as professionals. We have to view ourselves as professionals, that we provide a high-quality service that is, is deserving of that price. Cecil always tells the story about the washing machine repairman, right? That guy gets 200 bucks an hour. We are underpriced in this industry, and we have been for 30 years. Uh, I, you know, I, I just want to make a comment because I, 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 I do a lot of research that's – those of you who know me know that that's what I do. And I've looked at other industries and I've never seen an industry who invests so highly in uh, education and training. So you've got technicians who have tons and tons and tons of experience and training and education along with just the cost of the tools to do the job. And I, I've never seen another industry do, do it to this level. Um, I want to, I want to bring in, uh, we did a, I, I did a post uh, on our Facebook group and I want to mention a couple of the comments that came off of there. Now the post read, when it comes to creating value, where do shops often go wrong? Um, I asked them to list their thoughts and what they think, you know, happens. Um, Robert Silverstein said they fail to recognize the need to create a relationship with their customers since there's no line or item or metric that is added to the company and P and L that reflects the state or the health of those relationships created, those are forgotten. So Tom, when you're, when you're shifting your, so you made the change, you know what it's like, how would, how do you change your, your clientele from your old model to your new model? 
Yeah, so there's a, there's a specific order to that, right? Um, so it starts with me. Um, I had to understand my worth. Um, I used to not know that. Uh, I know that quite well, and that's why, uh, that's why I was successful. That's uh, Patrick. It's obvious he knows that quite well. He's a confident guy. He knows his worth, right? So we have, I know my worth now. Uh, I know that uh, what I bring to the table um, I know that anybody that brings their car to my shop, that was a, a great idea. You know what I mean? A hundred percent believe it. Um, therefore I can, I can convince my team of the same thing. Uh, my team understands their worth. Uh, they understand what the overall goal of our shop is. Uh, they're all on board and then it's up to the team to convince the customers. Cause obviously I've got, uh, you know, an average of 300 customers every month times 12, so, uh, and not all of them come every year. So four or 5,000 customers, I can't go out and convince every customer. Um, I had to convince myself, had to convince my team and then the team handles it from there. We all know our worth and, uh, they're all motivated uh, and empowered to do the right thing. Therefore the customers see and feel that. And, uh, uh, I run a shop that allows my advisors to have the correct amount of time to spend with the correct customer so that we can educate them and show them our value. And that's kind of how it all, all those things have so, to come together. Can I, so back can to, I, can I, I got to cut yeah. in. Um, uh, and I'm just asked a question. It's a devil's advocate question. Then I'm going to make a statement afterwards. Uh, Tom, is there, is there a physical aspect uh, to this? I mean, you said the team, but does the shop need to look and feel a certain way uh, for that customer to uh, perceive that value, to get that value out of the business. That's definitely a piece of it. Everything has to work together. I don't necessarily think that is honestly the most important part, but that's definitely one of the easiest parts. I mean, how hard is it to make, you know, it's a lot easier to uh, convince the shop owners we work with uh, to, to slap some pain on than to change their own mindset. Right. Well, so. if there's, if there's a sense that, that, I mean, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to get your staff invested, excited about your business. And then if they're working in a hole, you know, and you're not, you're not cleaning it up and you're not, the lighting's not good. And, and, you know, there's, it's, 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 it's messy and disorganized. Then the staff is going to feel a certain way. And maybe that's what they're used to, but maybe they've just given up on, it's going to be better here. Right. That, that's yeah. kind of what I'm, I'm saying. I mean, it's a package. It's not, it's not just one thing. I mean, the owner has to believe, the staff has to believe, we have to do things for our staff and for our customers that make them believe. Uh, you know, that is loaner cars. That is cleaning the, the, the tech bathroom up. That's, that's um, you know, making sure that you have a standard for the, how the, the shop looks. I, I need to make, so, so I didn't want to go too far down that, that hole, but, but I think it needed to be stated. But I need to make another comment, you know, I think in this industry, we have these guys that, that work very, very hard. They know how to do that. They spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on tools. Uh, they know how to do that. Um, but they didn't go to college. So they didn't pay $150,000 or $100,000 or $80,000 for a college education. So they, they see themselves at a lower value. Now, I went to school when I was older. I went back to college when I was 38. And, and got a couple of degrees. And I can tell you, those kids that were in the school, they didn't know much more when they left than when they started. You know, I mean, my education has come working on cars, uh, having customers tell me no at the counter, um, you know, um, uh, uh, having failures in, in my business. And that has built my value and made me feel better about myself and what I have to offer than probably anything else. I, I think we got to get rid of this idea that, you know, people, well, they went to college, so they should be worth more. Bull, right? I mean, we, we take care of the second most expensive thing that you have and the thing that's most <coughs> closely tied to your freedom. Man, I'll tell you, that ought to have some value. I, I, think, I think a lot of that went into, and I, I just want to mention this because it's something that I've been kind of keeping my finger on the pulse of. Um, so Mike Rowe has his, his, his foundation. You should check it out. Everybody who knows Mike Rowe at Dirty Jobs. Um, but they talk about back in the day, colleges kind of started getting, uh, again, with government funding, they started marketing. 
And they marketed this idea that the higher education, the, the, the college is where the money's at, where the esteem is, where the, that, that white collar was better than blue collar. And they had this negative, well, you don't want to end up like that guy. They literally made posters of a technician with a dirty shirt with, you know, you don't want to end up like him. You need a higher education. So I think in that changing perception, um, I'm going to try and bring this full circle here, changing the perception as, as just people out there, um, is, is one of the key things we need to realize happened. It's not that we're devalued. It's that people just think we are right. And that kind of seeds owners own, um, feelings about it. I want to bring in, um, Seth Thorsten made a comment that kind of ties in with this. He says the general public's perception is, is almost the dealer is better. So we should try to reinforce that by saying that we don't have equipment or only, only the dealer. I'm gonna, I got to make a comment. I'm sorry, yeah. Seth, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> in the last three years, uh, the general public has actually said the independence is a better place to get my yeah, car. That's, that's been changing. Um, and, and millennials so, like to do business with small businesses. <clears throat> yes, they do. <clears throat> you want to know? You do you want to know why? Um, what's worse about having the perception or having a perception out there that the customer has a perception that we, we don't have value? What's worse is that we have a perception we don't have value. If yeah, we, we believe it. If, right? Yeah, if we if we didn't believe if we believe that we had real value, then all of us would be doing uh, better as an industry. You know, there's just too many guys here that don't understand that, that, that they're, they're of worth and they ought to be making, you know, 20% net out of the bottom of their business. They work hard. Um, business is for building wealth. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, Tom, we did kind of skip over this. Back to Robert's comment about the relationship. So, when, you're, when you transitioned, I just want to see if we can tie this in as far as how did you keep those, those relationships built and how did you strengthen those while you were transitioning? Um, I use the word transparent a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very upfront. Uh, if you ever want to know something, ask me and I will tell you. Um, and on top of that, usually you don't even have to ask me. I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, <laughs> but I'm very, I'm very transparent. I'm very transparent with my staff. Um, therefore, I'm very transparent with my customers. I had to... I had to fill in uh, a couple Fridays ago why my advisor shot a, a cool video. Uh, I had to hit the counter, which uh, honestly I don't have the skills for anymore. But I had a I had a customer we brought in that wasn't necessarily our customer. He uh, he had a BMW, which is normally our customer, but he had a BMW older race car. All he wanted it to do was to pass the race inspection, and he was a researcher, do it do it yourselfer, and. Uh, can fix most things, but he didn't have time. He only had three days and he knows uh, tech can do it in a day. So therefore, yeah, I'm gonna do it yourself or I can do it in four days. So his car comes in, it needs two grand worth of stuff, you know, uh, all fairly easy stuff to change. But, you know, by the time we buy the part and we mark it up, like we have to, and then you add on the labor, you know, a job that he could have done himself and bought a part for 50 bucks he's not only paying me the labor, but he's paying me, you know, 140, 150 bucks for that part. So we had a very honest conversation. He's like, gosh, I can do this myself. I can get the part for 50 bucks. So I simply, I bring him on my side of the counter. We look it up. I'm like, yeah, so can I, here's my parts matrix. Believe it or not, this is what I have to charge you. And I explained to him, okay, you got a dollar. I bring a dollar into my business out of that dollar. I need to I need to pay my technician, pay for the part. After that, I got to keep 60 cents of that dollar. Outside of that, I got to use another 10 cents, pay my advisor, so on and so forth, marketing. At the end of the year, that dollar ends up being, in a, in a perfect world, it ends up being 20%, uh, 20, you know, two, uh, 20, cents. Two, uh, 20 cents. I am not, uh, I'm not there this year. I've made some improvements and stuff. But in a perfect world, a dollar turns into 20 cents. And uh, so for you to stand on that side of the counter and ask me to discount something, you know, 40, 50%, I'm only making 20%. So I, I can't pay you to work on your car. And so I just really explained to him what I charge and why I have to charge it. And the, the light went off. He thanked me for explaining that. Nobody else has. And now he's out. He's probably going to be one of my best referral sources. And yes, he did pay me $2,000 to fix his car that he could have done himself for 800 bucks. But that's the value we bring, you, you know. So, you literally, so long story short, you have to, 
you have to take the time to explain it. Most people just don't know. They just, you know, they say a part's 50 bucks. Why am I paying you 120? You have to explain why. And, and people are people. They understand once we explain it. We just do a terrible job of explaining it. So. That's, that's kind of what you meant by transparency. That is transparency well, here. This is how we do it. For sure. Why not? Why would you not? You yeah. Know? To yeah. dig into that a little bit more, it, it's, it's, a, it's about relationships, right? This, this job is about relationships. Uh, sales is about relationships. Um, you know, when, when a new customer comes in, like Tom had, you know, it's about, he just, however, however that connection needs to be made, Tom made that connection, right? Uh, if, if, if your service advisor, if the culture in your shop and, 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 and who you guys are as a shop isn't uh, creating relationships, then, then your, your sales are going to be less. You're, you're, you're going to devalue your product, all of these things. But when you start doing these things and create and teach to create relationships at the counter, your sales will increase. You'll be able to charge more. Um, uh, I, I equate it to a first date. Um, every time somebody comes in, it's a first date. I'm on my best behavior. I come out from behind the counter, shake their hand, greet them, welcome them, thank them for coming to their shop. Let's take a walk out to your car so I can see what's in their car. Right. I want to see baby seats. I want to see golf clubs. I want to see surfboards. I want to see something. Right. Um, and, and then I start a conversation. So I'm connecting with people. And, and, and that's what Tom did. He, he connected with them. It was over something else. But what I want to do, what I want to do when I'm at the counter is take them to their happy place. Right. I see a car seat. Oh, you have a baby. How old your baby? Is it a boy or a girl? Right. I have kids too, blah, 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 blah. But it's about people connect with people and talk, talk. It's, it's, it's all relationships. And most of us as technicians aren't very good at relationships. We're good at solving puzzles. And, uh, <laughs> and that's, and that's the problem. That's why if you're, if you're, if you're an owner who doesn't understand um, perceived value or uh, added value services, then find somebody who does hire him, let him make you a lot of money so that you can retire someday and you don't have to work the rest of your life and kill yourself. What about, what about this idea uh, in our industry that um, the customers um, aren't going to pay? Um, if I do that, if I, if I hold the line on my pricing, if I have that conversation, the customers are going to say, no, they're going to find someplace else that's cheaper than me. You know what, Cecil? Um, you and I, you and I've been around this industry long enough to know that the old business model was was designed around cash because everybody paid cash, cash right? In. It was cash in. Nothing was reported. As soon as the credit cards came into this industry, we should have we should have increased thirty to forty percent right there, the whole industry. But they kept running the same business model. Because the cash flow drops, everybody. And, and then there was no cash, right? And then there was no cash. We've got no way to hide what we're making, and everybody went into poverty. All the technicians were underpaid for years. It, it just—it was a nightmare. And 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 to get back to your point, um, that's the old business model. Everybody's still trying to run. You have to change and shift your business model to to this if you want to make money. You. You've got to make money so that you can take care of your people, get them the training they need. Uh, all the things that you need to run a business are there. Will people leave? Yes, some will. Bye. Let them go. I, I took a shop from $97 an hour with an effective labor rate of $80 an hour to $140 an hour in six months. I lost, I don't know, 10%. I've already doubled revenue and I've been in business for eight months. I've already doubled his last year revenue. Um, it, it's, but we're doing a better job. We've got quality people in there. Uh, the, my marketing is designed to, to, to bring people, the right people in. Um, I do a lot of branding. It, it's, it all has to work together, but look, there's a butt for every seat. Um, the guy down the street, uh, he's, he's, he's $90 an hour and I send people to him all the time. Uh, I fired a couple customers because they agreed to do it at my price and they came in and said, I can get it done cheaper. I'm not paying it. I said, here's your keys. Get out of here. You know, yeah, you're not going to pay me for my, for my work. Leave. I didn't, I don't even can care. Can you imagine, 
in any other industry, in any other business, you know, hey, I'm not going to pay the electric guy what the electric costs. I'm not going to pay for that. That that gas is a uh, you know is, is three dollars and fifty four cents a gallon. I'm not I'm paying, paying that. that. <laughs> right? You know, you, uh, it just. It, it, I, I don't think- know. I wish there was like some magic button I could do to create value in the minds of the guys that own these businesses, the family, <laughs> people, the women that own these businesses and run these businesses. You're worth something and your life is worth something. You know, um, you know, I, I always tell the story of my dad. I mean, he's this hardworking guy. He knew how to work hard. He was that generation. And, uh, you know, but he didn't, he didn't feel like he had value. He didn't feel like he was worth anything because his education wasn't, the same as someone else's uh you know in this in this day of it's okay to be whoever you want to be gender or or uh or or worship whoever you want to worship or or whatever we still have a stigma that is in the industry we are allowing that we're creating that we're making that happen within our we have no value so stop it yeah so just stop it stop it Man, if there was a magic button, my gosh, what would what would the world be like on the other side of that, right? When when people really valued themselves. Well, I gotta we make to, a comment. We have to invent that button. And then yeah, I'm working on it, buddy. I keep I, I do it one at a time. It's not enough, it's not fast <laughs> enough. Um, I gotta make a comment about Hans. Hans said, "I'm educated." Uh, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we're all educated. If you own and run an automotive repair shop, if you fix cars. You have education. Ex- you have experience value. Experience is education. Experience yeah. Is education. I mean, oh, my God. It, it isn't about I got a college degree. I got one. It's on the wall in my office. You know what it's worth? No, Nothing no. in this business to me. Everything I have, everything I'm worth is because of what I've gone through and the experience and the education that I've gotten in this business while doing this business. Yep. Um, all right, Kent. Uh, back well, to you, buddy. We're going to. We're going to take a break. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to remind everybody that our time has changed. So if you're going to, if you're seeing this later after this live broadcast, those of you who are obviously on live, you realize this. Uh, our time has changed to Wednesdays at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That is the first and third Wednesday of every month. Um, so just keep an eye out for those. Those are going to be coming out frequently. We just made the time shift. Um, I also want to say that we are introducing our after hours show soon uh for the leading edge um it's going to include it's gonna it's gonna be like i don't want to define the times just yet so maybe we'll save that for the next announcement but it's going to be about we're gonna have targeted educational pieces we're gonna have guest appearances we're going to have some debates and that's kind of one thing we we really wanted to do and this this wasn't necessarily the the place for that so the after hour show is a little more you know um flexible that we can do debates uh, and arguments and it will be moderated and be fair. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. Uh, BJ, you've been kind of quiet for a while. Boy. So I know. <laughs> Can't get a word in. Boy. He's got, he's got to compete with everybody here. <laughs> a bunch of word hogs up here, huh? <laughs> yeah, man. I, I'm out of here. <laughs> um, Stefan uh, Grabini. I, Grabina, I hope I said that right, uh, Stefan. Um, commented said i don't think value is the issue i think trust is the issue i get a lot of cars and customers for second opinions because their other shop or the dealer told them x when really they need y it's the same thing i think you need both yeah but i mean here's the thing you have to build that trust right and and first you give them that perceived value when they come in and hopefully you treat them uh really good and you fix their car and they're really happy and they go down the road and you start building that trust. Um, I don't think that you can build the trust in one day. I think it takes time. Um, sometimes you can, but I think you, uh, you build that trust over time. They, you build these relationships and stuff, um, you know, and, and you instill the value in them. And, and then over time, I think, um, you know, you uh, generate some really good customers and stuff. But uh, I think, I think trust is uh, definitely, definitely valuable. And, 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 you know, um, I think he's right in that. I think, I think a lot of people and you, dad, you said it earlier. I had it in my mind just to say, you know, trust, trust yourselves. You guys are valuable. You are valuable. You have value. Please understand that you have value. You can't build trust with your clients if you don't trust yourself. Exactly. Um, You can't. And, and by the way, you know, you know, yes, he's right. 
uh, and no, he's not. Right. Um, without the trust, they're not going to value what you have. They're not going to trust you. They're not going to see it. Without the so, value, they can't build trust. Right, so I right. do a lot of things in my business to create trust. I mean, we're, we're, we're um, what's the word, Tom? Uh, uh, transparent. Transparent. Um, I love that. I love that. Um, we look organized. And, and you know what? We're not organized every day. And uh, some days behind the curtain, you know, uh, Oz is back there pulling levers and all that just frantically. But on the front of it, it looks comfortable. It looks nice. It feels nice. And, and that builds trust with the customer. You know, I, I go out to their the car and I have a conversation with them out at their car about something that's important to them. Uh, maybe it is the car. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's their kids or their dog or whatever. And, and that builds trust. I think, um, one of the, I think one of the words that's missing here is confidence, right? Confidence. Confidence. I think that's a big word in this. And I think we have to instill that confidence in, in our people. And we need to convey that confidence to our clients uh, when, when we're talking to them. They need to know that we're the professionals. We're confident in that. And we're confident we're going to take good care of them. And that now turns them into being confident to use us as their, uh, as their job. I would also say consistency um, because yeah. consistency creates trust. Yes. I have to deliver whatever my customer perceives the contract is. <clears throat> so if that is a discount job, because that's what I marketed, I have to deliver that. If that's a good warranty, then, you know, two years later when that customer has a problem, I got to suck it up and bring that thing in and take care of it because that's what I promised. I have to, you know, the whole, I, I don't know if you looked in the, the, the dictionary for the definition of trust um, in, in my world, it says, we make and keep our promises. That's how we build it. You know, it's the only way we build trust, you know, and, and inconsistency in marketing can create lack of trust. Consistency in marketing can create trust. Um, yeah. If I, if I see you on your ad and it looks like you're this way, I had a shop I work with uh, multiple shops um, running a discount model, a lot of free oil changes or you buy three, you get, you know, for 30 bucks or whatever very low average repair order. And I think the biggest problem with their business was that when you walked into the business, there were marble countertops and top tops and guys in, in, in shirts and ties. Um, because when you market that discount, it creates a certain image out there. And if the customer comes in and the image is different, then they're, they're at it. They're not, e they're not at ease. They're not comfortable. They're, they're wondering where the catch is and when the catch hits them, you know? Um, yeah. I think you're, I think the transparency of this is who we are and this is what we want and this is what we want to do for you. Um, if you, if, if you follow through and you are that part, you live it, you eat it, you breathe it, then, then you're going to have a much more trusting customer, even right from the start. And then you deliver on your promises. You get the car done on time. Yeah. You fix it right. You, you, you stand behind when things go wrong, you, you go out of your way to make sure that things are right. You know, you do follow up calls. Um, to say, hey, you know, we know you were in a few days ago. We just wanted to make sure everything was great uh, because you're concerned and you really are concerned. I mean, it's your business for one thing, but the other thing is, I mean, it's my name out there. It's my, it's my image out there. I, I want people to walk away from a relationship with me and go, wow, that guy, what a guy. And not, eh, right? I think, I think authenticity is really important in marketing right now. I mean, you've got big companies that are doing the, just shots with, you know, their, their cell phones in their hand, because a lot of people just want to see real people. The polish isn't necessarily uh, intrinsic, you know, of value. It doesn't speak value. It just, it seems like, well, they put on a face, but what are they really like? Yeah. Right. People want to see how you really are. And I think you need to make sure that it's a consistent message across the board. So you see it online, then you see it um, in, you know, uh, coming and driving past your shop, then you see it when they come in. It all has to be the same message, the same um, uh, vision, the, the same um, visual piece, That's right? Yep. yep. Um, I do want to pull in uh, a little bit of shameless self promotion at this point, since we're at the uh, 45 minute mark. Uh, and just speak to a little bit about our service advisor mastery course. Um, I'm actually wearing one of the shirts here. Um, uh, we've got 
th all three of the people who have worked really hard on this uh, to put together one of the most advanced service advisor trainings um, we believe in the industry. Um, uh, I don't know if Patrick or, or Dad, you guys want to talk a little bit about it. Um, Go ahead, Cecil. It's going to be amazing. I mean, I just um, I, I just signed up four five people for it uh, yesterday. Um, um, we're going to be full here pretty quick. Uh, uh, this this training is like nothing anyone's ever seen. You want to talk about value? Uh, follow up, follow through. <laughs> uh, um, uh, teaching your people the right concepts, teaching them how to think. Uh, you know, changing their their minds about who they are and about what they're worth and and uh, you know, go online, look, look, look at the stuff. Uh, 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 send us some questions about it if you'd like. Um, uh, uh, have your people attend. Uh, we, you know, I was in a group meeting yesterday. Uh, I think that's we've signed up, or we will sign up five out of that. Um, uh, people are very excited about it, and I can't wait to see what happens with these service advisors. I mean, um, you want to talk about value? We're going to teach them how to create value for your customers and how to create value for themselves and how to create value for you. Uh, and, and really feel it, really understand it and really know it. And we're gonna follow up every month, multiple times with them, uh, listen to their phone calls, we're gonna look at their KPIs, we're gonna interview them with you, the owner, every month and, and we're gonna help them whatever they struggle. This is, this is a program for everyone. Yeah, um, so and we're gonna get amazing results. I wanna say that uh, we have, we have a core curriculum that we built with this new principle, these new ideas of how to really change what training does for an advisor. Um, and so we've got this, this core curriculum, but on top of that, we have a variable curriculum that is tailored to the individual advisor so that if you've got a, a seasoned vet coming in and a, a newer advisor who's only maybe been you know, advising for six months, they can both come in and get uh, the most intensive training for them so it doesn't it doesn't um give up on on any of those uh, parts as well as the competitiveness of it um having them compete on different challenges uh, with their kpis um, it's a very complex and, and balanced system i talked to i talked to a shop owner yesterday that sent his service advisor to our two-day service advisor came back big change in the guy uh higher average repair order better stuff sent him to the three day, came back, uh, made another leap, you know, sent him to the five day, came back, made another leap. He's sending them to the year long program because he wants to invest in his staff and he knows that they're going to be fantastic when they walk away and, uh, and they're going to be um, just 10, 10, 10 steps above where they were, which is going to help the business uh, and, and talking about value it's going to build value for your customers and your clients. And not, not just for a year. There's some things that we've done to make sure that there's, there's continued growth for the next uh, two, three years. So even after they're done with the program, they're still going to continue to build value for the shop. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want, yeah, we're going to move on now. Done with the self-promotion. Um, I wanted to mention uh, Patrick McHugh. Uh, he, he sent me a video that they just did for, their shop and honestly that there was somebody con uh, having a conversation back and forth in the group saying that you can't express value without giving a discount which yeah, exactly right you have to get them interested with some kind of hook you can't do that unless you get them in the shop and honestly i watched patrick McHugh's video and it is phenomenal uh tom your video that you guys just put together i, I watched those and i'm like wow that is value that's your value statement right there that's your USB right there. But but here's here's I have I want to be transparent. I want to have a relationship with that customer. All those things are really important to me. If I start my relationship off with a lie, you know, here's the twenty nine dollar oil change, the thirty dollar oil change, forty five dollar oil change on your Mercedes, you know, um, and then then that's not transparent. I mean, for me, that I, I don't need a discount to create value. Um, if that's the truth, then I've never created value in my life uh, at the counter because I've never discounted. I'm not a discounter, never have been. And I have sold millions of dollars worth of service at the service counter and, and, and very successfully and built uh, huge relationships with our customers. And I'm not saying you can't do that with discounts also. I'm just saying that the, to, to say there's only one way to do it and you have to bring them in with a discount is 
insane. It's not right. Um, all right, if you want to discount, great. That's your business. That's what you want to do, fine. And if that builds value for your customers, fine. I will build value for my clients in a different way. And I can and I have. All right, who is it? Wow, it's Tom. Tom. That's Tom. Tom. He's, he's right at the Air Force Base. He's right next <laughs> Sorry, guys. No worries. Um, I want to bring in another comment by Transparency. <laughs> Can I, I'm going to mute you just for a minute here, Tom. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Christian Porter uh, said something very interesting to me. So one of the ways that they built um, creating client value was the creation of a focus group. So they did focus groups. So they literally asked their people what they thought and what they, they found valuable. Um, Tom, do you want, are you still, I was going to say, Put do you me back in. There you go. All right. <laughs> Put me in coach. Sorry. Uh, what was the question again? I was uh, intently listening to see when the jets were getting away from me. So Christian Porter made a comment about creating focus groups. So literally asking their clientele what they saw was valuable. For sure. What a novel idea, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That sounds so cool. I'm at, uh, I'm at one hell of an advantage on a lot of shop owners as I get to hang out with, uh, on average, close to 40 shop owners on a weekly basis in a networking group. And I've built that relationship over years. Of, and these are, these are just not anybody. These are all shop owners that have the same values as you and I. We, we don't want to just, uh, I don't want to have an auto repair shop uh, that, that, that does okay. I want to be the auto repair shop, right? I don't, uh, I didn't, I didn't become a coach at the Institute because I want to be okay. I, I, I'm going to be the best, best coach. And I get to hang out with those same mindset uh, people. And then on top of that, they're also my customers. So the majority of them are, and the ones that aren't will tell me why they're not. So, so yeah, I get an outside perspective look at my business uh, on a regular basis. And that is actually, I can attribute uh, some of my biggest growth moments due to things I have learned when we get out of our own box, get somebody else uh, else's point of view, uh, women, men, uh, you crazy millennials, the, the baby boomers, there's, there's all these different mindsets. And if you can get out of your own way to accept some, uh, some good and bad criticism, uh, I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Be a little less sensitive, a little bit more willing to get out of your bubble. All right? a little bit. You might want to mute me again, buddy. I, th I think you should bring in your best customers on an annual basis, at least once a year. Take them, uh, provide a nice lunch for them, have them walk through your shop with a clipboard, uh, have them tell you what they see, because I think you go blind to it. Um, we, we run the 20s groups for World Pack. We're, 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 we have lots of 20s group members. We just went in and did a shop review. Beautiful shop. But we were able to give them 10, 15 good, good suggestions. We're going to create more value for them and more value for their clients. Um, and, and it's because we have different eyes, you know, we don't, we don't go to that same shop every single day and, uh, and see that same handprint on the wall and just kind of don't see it because it's always been there. We come in and we go, Oh my gosh, look, look there. And, and Fresh open eyes. people's eyes. I think you should have, you know, you think about your 10 best customers, invite 12 of them in five or six will show up, uh, uh, have them tell you what they want because, now that's my marketing. Now that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to be what my best customers want me to be as long as it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical. Um, yeah. And that's going to help me be successful in my company. That's, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's well said. I was going to, I was going to go on that, but I think that was like nail in the coffin there. That kind of hit it home. Um, yeah. We, I kind of want to lead this into marketing because our next show is going to be specifically marketing and attracting the right customers online, but I mean, a, a more, more marketing targeted. So you said, bring in your best customers. I don't think a lot of people, maybe they do, maybe they don't know who their best customer is, right? How do they go about building out what that looks like? There's, there's some interesting marketing, um, data out there right now or thought process and you know with the internet and and all the information out there sometimes it can get confusing 
you know, one person is saying do this, another person is saying do that. And, and people have had success uh, probably in, in both areas. I've always believed in, 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 in my marketing education that I need to define who my best customers are, or what, what I believe they want from me. Now, I could be wrong. I have been in the past, but then time tells you. So if, and if you ask your customers, they will tell you, you know, you, you come up with some great idea. We're going to do this wonderful program and nobody uses it. And then you go, okay, well, maybe it wasn't that great of an idea, but you <laughs> tested it, right? You, you're, you're constantly testing things in your business. And I think if you take the time, and that's another thing that we, we in our industry, we, we're so busy fixing cars that we forget to take the time to really manage the business and really think about marketing. And, and, and then maybe I'm not the guy to do the marketing for my company. Maybe there's someone else that ought to be doing it because, you know, I fix cars. Y yesterday, we were pretty hard on one of the group members because they're doing their own marketing and I'm kind of against it. I mean, they're doing their own website and all of that. And, you know, I said, uh, why don't you want your dentist, uh, you know, uh, 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 to fix his car, right? Because that's not what he does. I mean, and I'm not going to fix my own teeth. I go to my dentist and I pay my dentist to fix my teeth because that's his skill set. And, uh, you know, but I think I understand my clients and I think uh, I ask my clients regularly what they want. And, and, and maybe even I send a survey out once a year and say, hey, you know, what do we do best? And, and what would you like us to do that we currently don't do uh, to get some ideas? I think that's yeah. one of the ways that I, I have the ability to do that. Yeah. All right. Um, we're cutting it close. So I'm going to let's do final thoughts going around. Let's start with BJ. Uh, I'm going to say with your clients, show them the best experience possible. Every time that they come to your shop, be consistent with it. Be honest and fair. If you do those things, I think uh, you can build a substantial business. Good following. Awesome. Uh, Patrick? Um, <clears throat> when it comes to value, uh, I think we, we beat it to death. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, create relationships with your customers. Um, Find your own self-worth. Figure out who and what you are as a company. Uh, you can't just fix cars because everybody fixes cars, right? Uh, there's got to be something special about what you do and who you are. Um, it's really about redefining uh, yourself in this industry. Um, it's hard for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Everybody fixes cars. You, got, you need to do something different. Yep. I like that. Uh, Dad, final thoughts? Believe in yourself and get your people to believe in your product, that you have value and that you have worth. If you can't do that, you're never going to get what you can and what you should uh, out of your business. I think that's, yeah. um, to me, it's one of the most important aspects of this. Yeah. Um, Tom? Yeah. Uh, summing it up just like Cecil you got to know yourself know your worth but on top of that you got to educate you got to educate yourself educate your team and then uh, they will educate your customers uh, perception of our industry would change immensely if we just could give them a better view of what it is we do and how passionate we obviously are of this customers don't get to see that and that's uh, that's on us we, uh, we need to do a better job and and uh, obviously we are so it's going the right direction <laughs> All right. Um, thank you guys for being here. We had a great panel. Um, awesome to get Tom on so you guys can see him. He's, he's new to the company and we're excited to have him here. Um, you guys can check out other episodes by going to the Institute's leading edge, uh, dot podb com, or you can go, uh, you can find us on iTunes and Spotify by uh, looking up at the leading edge. Um, also on ifrave.com forward slash podcast. You can, you can view episodes there as well. Um, if you want to submit questions or topics, uh, you can do that directly through Facebook or you can email us at institute at ifrave.com. Um, join the Institute group. Those of you who are watching this and aren't part of the Institute group, please join the Institute group. It's full of a lot of uh, great, you know, performing top shops as well as our consultants in there just discussing topics like this. And our giving Facebook group. Yeah, our Facebook, Facebook group. Facebook group, the Institute group. <laughs> Um, and, uh, thank you those who did submit comments and, and questions. I really appreciated that. Um, our next episode, like I mentioned earlier, is going to be, uh, marketing and attracting the right customer. Um, what, what your ideal customer looks like targeting and retargeting, how you can utilize those to, um, really, really influence getting people into your shop that you want in your shop. 
um, and content message creation, SEO, stuff like that. Um, thank you guys so much for watching the, the Leading Edge and we'll see you uh, in two weeks. Bye, Take guys. care, guys. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>